Um, his name is Markian Kamish. He's a young Ukrainian author, and he has made it his, his expertise to write about the Chernobyl exclusion zone. In 1986, there was a horrible nuclear accident in what was the Soviet Union is now Ukraine that was probably one of the worst nuclear disasters in human history. Um, dozens of people died who were close to the, the, the source of the meltdown. Um, many other people were hurt from poisonous radiation. And Markian has spent a lot of time in this prohibited area in Ukraine, which has a huge barbed wire fence that stretches miles and miles. And there's a whole underworld within this space. And he's written a lot about that. And some people say this space is, is a preview of what, what it would look like if there's a nuclear holocaust. Radio, you know, radioactive, radioactive material, deserted homes, gas masks lying on the ground. What we all picture a nuclear holocaust would look like, the aftermath. They get a little taste of that in Ukraine. So I, wanna, I, I think there's no better way to introduce a writer than to read something that that writer has written. And I'm going to read um, from uh, Markian's novel. He's written three books. One's called The Zone, another one's called Kiev 86, and a new one is called Feral Scrap. And I'm going to read you this, and I think you'll see why I'm so excited to be next to him. And he clearly is excited to be here, taking pictures as we go. For me, the zone, and that's what they call this area of, uh, of Chernobyl, the exclusion zone, or just the zone. For me, the zone is a place of relaxation. Instead of the sea, the Carpathian Mountains, mind waste hills. Instead of turkey peppered with tanned whores and drought and chilled mojitos. Some 20 times a year, I, an illegal tourist to the Chernobyl zone, a stalker, a pedestrian, a self-propelled vehicle, an idiot, Call me what you want. I am not visible, but I am. I exist, almost like ionized radiation. What does it look like? I get my backpack ready, arrive at the barbed wire, and dissolve into the darkness of the policia forests, woodlands, and pine aromas, disappear among the dizziness of thickets, and no one anywhere in the world will notice me. This is about stalkers. Not those who collect children's gas masks across the bomb shelters of district cities, and not those who photographed unfinished, pissed-on buildings in residential areas. It's about others, about boys and girls who are not ashamed of putting backpacks on their backs and treading through cold rain to abandoned towns and villages where you can drink, where you can drink cheap vodka, break windows with empty bottles, swear too loud, and do other things which differ differentiate living towns from dead ones. It's about those who are not afraid of radiation and don't care about drinking from poisonous streams and lakes. My last week has been a road through darkness, the anxious anticipation of light coming from headlights and cigarettes. Then I hoped for a bed without a mattress and icy water from the frozen river. There was coldness and quenching of thirst. There was a patrol that I noticed at the last moment. There was grass, limp, dry and yellow, and then only a dead dream, so in the morning to run further to the north, to dive into fantasies, into a captivating land of abandoned homes, canals, and agricultural infrastructures. It's, it's a really strong prose. Um, so let's start with a couple questions. Uh, our writer here speaks some English, but he's more comfortable in speaking Ukrainian or Russian. And our translator here, uh, Sunil, is, is going to help us out. Um, so let me start by first thanking you for coming here and for sharing these stories, because they're really interesting. And the way you tell them is, is remarkable. Um, what's the craziest thing you've seen inside the zone? Um, thank you for this question. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for Jepur. Uh, Literature Festival. Uh, I'm sorry, I will speak in, uh, as usually I speak Ukrainian, but now I will speak in Russia, uh, because my translator don't understand Ukrainian, and he, uh, trans he will translate to you my words, my speaking. 
Итак, если говорить о том, что самое удивительное и самое невероятное из того, что я видел в зоне из явления, это даже не люди, которые собирают радиоактивный ядовитый металл, радиоактивные ядовитые грибы. Это не дикие животные, которые спят в заброшенных магазинах. Это абсолютная тишина и спокойствие. Это тот факт, что заброшенная земля вызывает у меня не страх и депрессию, а настоящее умиротворение. And, um, и если говорить о каких-то историях, которые меня действительно поразили, если говорить о ситуациях, которые мне uh, казались um, просто невероятными, то это история об одной бабушке, uh, которая жила uh, в заброшенном селе. Она вернулась туда после аварии доживать свой век, потому что она там выросла, в этой земле. И однажды к ней пришли люди из uh, National Geographic, чтобы взять у нее сотое интервью. Она была очень и очень известной в YouTube, ее часто снимали журналисты. И светотехник uh, National Geographic uh, начал расставлять софиты и светотехнику. Но после этого эта женщина просто-напросто сказала, нет, парень, я сделаю лучше и поставила софиты. Вот парадокс человека, который живет в зоне отчуждения. Вроде как он убегает от людей, вроде как он желает просто-напросто спрятаться, но он становится более знаменитым, чем Беар Гриллс. Okay, And the, he, the technical technical crew, the lighting guy, she, uh, she was not happy with the way the lighting lighting guy uh, put up the lights. So she helped and tell, told him, no, that's not the way. And she has become also very famous in the most famous person in the area. And he, the YouTube um, people are uploading her YouTube, YouTube uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, и отвечая, вот, заканчивая ответ на вопрос, что мне действительно uh, запомнилось и что меня изменило до конца и до неузнаваемости, это mm, тот факт, что uh, когда я однажды, будучи один, встретил uh, двух человек, которые собирали металл в мертвом городе, в брошенном городе ночью, и они хотели убить меня, Uh, и я действительно, тогда у них было оружие, я действительно был на грани того, чтобы, так сказать, заиметь какие-то проблемы. Uh, но благодаря своим коммуникативным навыкам я понял, что я могу быть не просто избитым, я могу получить новых друзей и новый литературный матери материал для моих книжек. To collect material for my novels. Yeah. L let me just give you a little background of what happened, and this is like the kind of uh, Wikipedia version. Um, but in April 1986, the engineers at this nuclear plant, the Chernobyl nuclear plant, were supposed to perform a test where they shut down the plant, uh, they shut down some power sources, and then they turned them back on. And something happened during that test where they, they screwed it up and there was a design flaw in the reactor and it caused this enormous explosion and then this incredibly hot fire and it sent just these plumes of smoke, radioactive smoke of, of radioactive material that was burning at a really high temperature up into the air and it just spread like this giant cloud across Western Europe. And this was in 1986. This was when the Soviet Union was, was strong and intact and the Cold War was on. And there was almost, a, a, I mean, I think there was, there was a cover-up to, to try to disguise the severity of what had happened. But the Soviets knew this was a disaster. And they were flying in helicopters to drop lead and other heavy metals on top of the fire to try to suppress it. And the, so much radiation leaked out during those first few days that this, this The circle around the reaction area has, has remained dangerous and radioactive to some degree. Um, I want to know just because he, th this Markian is 29 years old and he's written three books. Um, I'm 46 and I just published my first one. 
So he obviously does not have a fear of writing. He's, he feels good writing. It's easy for him, or he's, he's able to, to write fast and confidently. Will you tell us a little bit about your process and, and a little bit about yourself, your education, sort of how you came into this? So, uh, you know, I mm, just talk a couple of words in English, you know, about my uh, literature inspiration and about kitchen of my literature. You know, um, the zone for me, uh, it's a first of all uh, the source of inspiration. And yes, I violence, violence the law, but I constantly find, I constantly try to search uh, in the zone, my literature inspiration. And I constantly find it there because I see uh, that uh, illegal Chernobyl explorations like me make that place alive. They breathe life into the empty, uh, fragile uh, shells and uh, cracked concrete rods. They bright fire on the floors in dark nights. They drink alcohol, they smoke cheap cigarettes, they tell funny stories, and then uh, laugh and laugh and uh, loudly snort in the dark. They make Pripyat alive, uh, which something worth uh, to living and walking 40 kilometers in the cold night trying to hide in the dark from, from the policemen and cars. For me, this is main point why I go to the zone, why I went to the zone last seven years. Because last of seven years, I just uh, grab my inspiration. Because for literature inspiration, for really literature inspiration, you must feel abandoned. You must feel abandoned and you uh, go there when your sours, uh, when you think turns sour, you know. Uh, you sit in abandoned villages with your friends on your own and you drink a bottle straight from a bottle, you know, drink a vodka straight from a bottle and uh, abandoned person in abandoned place, it's like a double, it's like a triple shot in your head. It's a uh, you know, that thing can shot in your head like a double tequila at 7 a.m. in morning of Monday, like today, you know. And um, about my education, I have, uh, I've had uh, some mm, university uh, in Ukraine, uh, and I have mm, had some historian faculty, like history of the old Ukraine. But uh, it's not about, I've... Uh, I have leave my faculty, you know, after the uh, few years, because I want to explore the zone and I, um, you know, want to just uh, create the literature from this place, because it's the most interesting and most unbelievable place in the whole world for me. Now, okay, now we have some Fukushima, now we have some Fukushima, that's interesting too, but you know, uh, before the Fukushima and even now, we have a place, um, a piece of land the size of Luxembourg where people no longer live. Was a place was surrounded by barbed wire, like an alien world, like absolutely another world. And you know, I've had a lot of experience in the zone in all times, but uh, you know, um, about two years after my first visit into Chernobyl zone, I've understood that the first impression from this place were total crap, absolutely total crap, because it's absolutely another, uh, absolutely typical um, emotions of first contact. It's like about bloggers, but if we're talking about literature, we need to deep immersion. We need really deep immersion. So. I've just destroyed early draft of my novel, early draft of my novel, because I've realized it, that the most important, most important and most interesting text about this amazing, unbelievable place could be written by a person who has been there for a long, long time. You know, and after this, I've 
started to write again, and uh, this little excerpt, uh, which Jeffrey read uh, a few minutes ago, this is uh, just a part of it, and uh, something like this. Is, is there any romance in the zone? Romance with girls? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, it's, it's, or with boys, it's no problem for me. I'm not homophobic, you know. <laughs> so, uh, if you're talking about love for many of illegals, you know, love for illegals, first of all, is the zone. Because many of illegals, many of Ukra Ukrainians told about it, you know, the zone is like a girl. Because uh, in one day, you feel some passion to the zone. You want to the zone. You won't leave your work. You won't go to the one week and spend the time in this absolutely amazing place. You need to really feel abandoned city around you. You need to uh, sit in abandoned flat and drink vodka with your friends. But when you was calmed, you want to home, always. Some journalist asked me about, okay, Markian, uh, so um, what is um, mo main point message uh, which you want to, uh, to tell every journalist when you stay in the zone? I said, I want to home. <laughs> every time, you know, every time. And um, uh, for me, uh, first of all, romance, in the zone, it's a romance with place. It's like geopoetic, geopoetic, poetry of the place, poetry of the uh, cities. But yes, uh, about uh, gender questions, that's an interesting question because uh, in illegal society, in illegal society, uh, we have some part of girls who uh, went to the zone for years who had a many, a lot of experience, but they don't like some publicity, like boys. It's a typical attribute for boys. Don't kiss and tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, mm, uh, but uh, yeah, we have, and uh, I've had some girl in five years ago, and we, uh, we've had together, you know, like a 30 trips in Pripyat, and we spend at nights, we uh, spend at nights in abandoned church, like, a, you know, and we create some uh, acid party place, and um, it's like a little bit squat. But you need uh, you need squat some di some place because all place is yours. It's feeling of absolutely freedom. You know, it's absolutely amazing. Well, give us give us a sense, and, and I got the, I got from from what I read of yours um, and what you're saying now, I, I get this sense of exhilaration the freedom, uh, living in a place that doesn't have rules, um, a place that you kind of discover yourself that's been abandoned. Give us a sense of what you do in the zone. So you, you said that you sleep in these abandoned buildings, but besides sleeping, you, you get there during the day, you sneak in. What, ta what would you do in a typical day in the zone? Uh, you know, uh, if you're talking about typical illegal Chernobyl explorator, like stalker, but it's a bad word because in English stalker, it's a man who tried to stalk some woman. I don't want to association with this word, so I'm illegal explorator. So typical day of many illegals in the zone is uh, many vodka, many explorated of the city, because when you go into the big city, Pripyat is for 50,000 people, where people no longer live, you know. So mm, most of the day, uh, you try to explore every flat, every roof, you know, and try some catch some photos and so on. But uh, if we're talking about me, um, yeah, I've did it many years. But last two year, uh, last two years, I've had some. Uh, helping with uh, investigation about illegal logging of pine trees in Chernobyl exclusion zone. Because we have a problem in Chernobyl exclusion zone. A bad people for, from our government uh, try to uh, create a corruption, you know, with uh, illegal logging. And I've installed many of trackers for trying to uh, you know, uh, create a base of, you know, 
create of evidence for this, you know, and try to stop it. Because zone for me, the zone for me, it's not about only literature inspiration. It's not only about, uh, you know, uh, exploration. Yeah, it's a first step. It's the first um, a step of immersion in this place. And uh, I went to the one of the Jeffrey event a few days ago, and Jeffrey told uh, important issues, important things about mm, empathy. When we uh, work with material, when we work with people uh, and place, like peoples, like journalists, like explorators, we need to take care about this place, about these people. We can't not just attack. We, we can't not just a grab. We are not a Donald Trump, you know. So, <laughs> so we need have uh, create some investigations, and this is part of my job. I don't like corruption. I I'm a I'm an Ukrainian who burned on the edge of Soviet Union and 80, in eighty eight, and I don't want you know have some see some corruption in my country. So. I'm back for your question, you know. You asked me what of part of my day, big part of my day. So last two years in my zone, uh, in my zone, in my personal zone, it's my home. I often uh, repeat, you know, my zone. It's my zone, it's my city, you know. Uh, big part of my day, typical day, is I'm trying to hiding and install the tracker under the truck and uh, I run from these guards and uh, uh, come back and take a chisel and hammer and try to install it in the, you know, like pine tree. <laughs> so for me, it's something like this. So, so what, what he's referring to is that there's a, it, there's a business now inside the zone of um, illegal businesses chopping down trees and, and bringing them out of the zone and selling them for, for timber. Um, this is illegal, the government's supposed to prohibit this, and it seems that they are in cahoots and working closely with the guys who are committing these offenses. Let's, let's talk a little bit about health issues, uh, radiation. Yeah. Um, how, how dangerous is it? Do you ever feel any effects? Uh, only sitting, on, only on my face, you know. It's alcohol, a little bit of radiation, you know. <laughs> uh, frankly speaking, you don't have a problem with radiation in the zone now. Yeah, we had some problems 30 years ago. We had some problems. We uh, we've had uh, huge levels of radiation. But now uh, there are much, uh, much lesser radiation there because of half-life period, you know, uh, and uh, living of nuclear elements, you know, so it's lesser and lesser and lesser. Yeah, sure, we have danger place even in Pripyat. It's some basement where you can find, if you really want, if you're so stupid, you can find a very dangerous things, uh, uh, parts of clothes, uh, first firemen who came to the fire from Pripyat on the fire cars with helmets, you know, to the nuclear power plant. So, uh, yeah, it's a danger, but it's a few hot spots, and, you know. And, wh and why would those clothes still be radioactive and the rest not be radioactive? Uh, you know, uh, because it's uh, different types of radiation. Because we uh, have some another types of radiation, so um, if you're talking about yod, uh, he have a very, uh, very short term of life, like a half-life period. And uh, some another, in another hotspots, yeah, it's, uh, you know, danger too much more time, you know, so still we have some problem. But for illegal exploration, for me, I don't care about it. I don't have a Geiger counter, I don't have radiation, you know, it's a, it's a main rule. But, um, you know, I just... Uh, have a drink water in this place uh, seven years from every pool with duckweed, with uh, dead animals in this pool, you know, it's usually, but um, it's not about radiation. Most problem it's for just the dirty water because strontium in strong uh, and cesium in, in water, it's no problem because it's on, on, the, on the bottom. And you just uh, grab a little bit water from the, you know, yeah, something like this. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about your, I'm sure there's some people in the audience that w like to write or want to write. Um, let's talk a little bit about writing. Now, your first book, The Zone, uh, and your third book, uh, Feral Scrap, you feel, you feel good about. There's a book in between, uh, Ukraine 1986, Ukraine 86? Uh, Kiev. Kiev, I'm sorry, Kiev 86. Um, you didn't think that was such a strong book. So tell us like, why you were able to write two books that you really believed in and feel good about, and one book that you think wasn't so great. Okay, yeah, it's my problem, because my first novel uh, about mm, Chernobyl illegal explorator, like in Tarkovsky movie, uh, it's about, um, <coughs> it's confession of illegal Chernobyl stalker, you know? And the uh, last one, it's a Pharaoh's scrap, it's about marginal people, you know, with the shirt cuts, with uh, iron tooth, who uh, grab a metal nearby the zone, poison metal, but my second book, uh, it's about alternative history. It's about alternative reality. Because um, we have a really, really um, dangerous situation in 1986. Because we have a really chance to evict it all Kyiv. It's the capital of Ukraine. It's a city with one million population. And in this book, in my second book, I've created situation like this. And it's like alternative story. And I now I realize that I just don't like about alternative stories. So I want to forget about this book. Uh, maybe every writer had something like this, you know. <laughs> so you don't know about it. You just uh, write only one book, you know. No, listen, and I think it's good that you, you try different things um, and you see if they work or they don't work. Now tell us a little bit about your writing process. Like when you're really inspired, um, are you writing several hours a day at one stretch? Or are you kind of attacking uh, the, the subjects you want to write about a few hours and then do something else? Are you online and checking other things while you write? Or are you totally kind of you know, shut off from other sources of information? Uh, <clears throat> you know, for me, it's a very uh, specific process. Uh, I am a right if I uh, write in, uh, if I write about Chernobyl exclusion zone, about my experience or my imagined story, you know, like a pharaoh scrap. I need to uh, special condition with mind changing. Some someone from writers try to uh, take some drugs, some alcohol. I don't need it. I need just uh, another perception of time after my. Uh, you know, um, returning from the zone. It's absolutely another format uh, of the world perception. Because when you've spent uh, a couple of days, and even best case, one week or more in abandoned city, you feel absolutely different. You forgot about, you know, speed of cars on this road. You forgot about traffic jam. You, for you forgot about typical behavior and behavior patterns of all of these people around you. You forgot about all of this thing. And you are starting to think absolutely another. You will come back from the zone and you need to sit and in your post-effect mind, it's, it's too short, you know. It, it will mm, half-life half life too, you know, it's like, a <laughs> and uh, you need to write so quickly because it's uh, like a hot... While it's fresh, while it's yeah, fresh. While it's fresh, because if it's done fresh, no, it's absolutely another prose. And I very, um, you know, love to write from the morning because I when I've come back from the zone, it's morning, as usually, because I need to go through the barbed wires into the early, early sunset, where gu when guys from police uh, will be asleep in his jeep, you know, because it's a typical situation, you know, go, go to the uh, old enter in the zone, illegal enter, and uh, in this place you will uh, meet some police patrolling, but at 4 a.m. this guy's just, uh, you know, good sleeping in salon of, a b of his car, you know. But, but tell us about the writing. So you sit down, you, you want to hit it when it's fresh, yep. when you've just come out of the zone. 
Um, are you writing for hours at a stretch? Are you offline? Are you doing it by hand or by, by laptop? <coughs> uh, you know, only laptop. Last seven or eight years, I use only laptop. Before, yeah, I've used some like a writing uh, with pen and sheets of paper. But you know, <coughs> more productive is a laptop because you can edit it and in dynamic modes, you know, you can create new documents and files. And uh, in these questions, in these, um, you know, um, issues and in these methods, I want to be some transhumanist, you know. I want to use every detail from and every useful thing uh, which I have from the contemporary world because I love the contrast I love the contrast because when I w when I went to the Chernobyl exclusion zone to abandon its cities for inspiration in abandon it in in old epoch of Soviet Union of this dead empire I hate Soviet Union really but I love architect of Soviet Union I've amazed of late Soviet modernism it's not about uh, transhumanism. It's absolutely another world. Two worlds, two contrasts, you know. And between these worlds, on edge, that's my literature method. And feeling contrast, it makes your texts a little bit, you know, like a little bit too emotional, too, you know, with your heart and from your heart. Okay, we got a few minutes left. I'd, I'd love to hear some questions. Sir. Hold on one sec. Do we have anybody with the mic? Why don't you just yell as loud as you can? <laughs> Let me just repeat that so everybody can hear. So the question is, he went through a process where he found the beauty and the peace uh, and, and a place that really inspired him. And your, your, your point is that a lot of people look at Chernobyl and they're like, this is a horrible place. Uh, it's where a lot of people died. It's a lot where a lot of people suffered. So how did you come into it and how did your, your opinions and feelings evolve? Uh, thank you very much. It's an important question. It's a very good question because it's a big problem in Ukrainian society, in Ukraine perception of this place. Um, you know, my father was working uh, in uh, Institute of uh, Physics, in nuclear physics in Ukraine, in, um, when uh, Chernobyl blew it. And like a volunteer, he went to the zone and worked like a relief worker on the nuclear power plant in 1986. Alre he is already died, you know? And I know about problem and I feel and I felt problem with this place. But uh, even despi despite of this, despite of this, we need to find and we need to try create a new perception because most of books about the zone in both in Ukraine and in another, in another world is about a past. Uh, it's all uh, represented a retrospective view of this place, like a great one work of Alexievich, Svetlana Alexievich, who, uh, who, had, who has Nobel Prize it a couple of years ago. But yes, it's okay. It's a really place where we have some, you know, problems. But in another place, we uh, have problems too, like in Bangladesh, li like in, you know, Delhi, like in another city, like in Africa. Jeffrey, maybe know more, much more about it. So, um, so we don't need to create new perception. We need. In Kyiv, we had a war a uh, few, uh, you know, few dozens years ago between USSR empire 
and between the Nazi empire. So I can't uh, write about Kyiv. I won't. And I want to create a new reality, contemporary rea reality, because 99% of books about the zone is about the past. My book about the zone, my novel about the zone is about contemporary zone, you know. It's about contemporary socia society. And it's about actually questions, you know, to the, uh, our agenda. So, okay, what had happened in the zone? So, it's these guys couple of drunk guys tried to steal some radioactive metal. Okay, that's, that's okay. So this is the poachers, this is your smugglers, this is your illegal stalkers, this is your another people. It's much more interesting for me, you know? So that's my perception. Perception. Yes, sir. Hold on one sec, he's, he's bringing you a mic. Thank you, I'd like to ask about the wildlife situation presently. Birds, rats. What do you live with their cats? Oh. Is there anything did, alive? Did, did everybody hear that? This man wants to know about the animals that live in the zone. <coughs> Birds, rats, cats. Like, how are they doing with the radioactive, radioactive material? Yeah, are they there? Uh, oh, thank you for these questions. Yeah, it's really interesting, too, because uh, after the accident at Chernobyl 32 years ago, after the barbing wire, you know, uh, wild animals have been breeding there, you know, like uh, deers. Uh, like uh, wild boars, uh, like uh, uh, wild horses, and many of wolves. I have regular contacted with wolves, and I have already don't scare these animals because I've realized that these animals scare me too, you know? They're afraid too. <laughs> even even they're hungry. It's no problem for people because uh, the human is a big animal, you know? So, and even a beers, and luckily I've never met the last one for me. Uh, so, um, in Pripyat now, you know, it's um, interesting situation because we have uh, many birds, like uh, falcons, you know, where absolutely, you know, it's like a huge count of birds. And um, uh, we have some, uh, uh, you know, like uh, <coughs> lynx. One of my friends, ecologist, environmentalists who working in the zone like official worker, like official zoologist, uh, told me about story with another zoologist. They tried to catch of, you know, uh, some animals in the zone and they find, they found in one of the vodka market, uh, you know, the li like a some part of links, you know, links uh, just to go, just went in the magazine in the market of for vodka and just come out, you know. So it's a uh, constantly, mm, you know, you have a uh, constantly experiences and uh, you uh, have a uh, constantly uh, meetings with animals and finally, finally, your perception of animals will be changed, you know you have another perception of animals because now when I see animals in the zone, I don't think about, oh, I need to run. No, I think about, okay, okay, where's my camera? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, something like this, you know. Okay, we got time for one more question. Let me get you in the front, please. Uh, do you think that uh, in near future there is possibility of uh, human settlement there in, uh, in that zone? So, so the question is a really good one, like will people ever come back to the zone? Will it ever be possible to live in the zone again? <laughs> oh, thank you for this question, because it's main interesting questions, uh, because it's a different uh, understanding of this place from people in Ukraine and people from and other countries. Because people in Ukraine, people who live in Ukraine, uh, never asked me this question. Because they are totally realize it about, you know, like it's, it's absurd. And I uh, try to explain why. I've had some experience in France when I had uh, my publication of my book in Arto, in some publishing house, it's Flammarion Group, you know couple of years ago, and people asked me the same thing. Markian, when people will come back? And I've, you know, answered, we don't need it. Because Ukraine 
it's a big country, really. We have a lot of territory. After, of, after, even after the Putin invaders, we still have many, many, uh, you know, grounds and fields, you know, without people. So for why we need to come back people to these places, you know, with radiation? We just can uh, give some lands to these people without radiation. So we don't need it, you know? Listen, guys, we're, we're out of time, and I just want to thank you for coming, and let's give him a really warm round of applause. His work hasn't been translated yet into English, but I think it's really interesting subject material. His writing skills are really strong, so I have no doubt that uh, you will have some success in this, and hopefully a lot more people will be able to read what you've done. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for this uh, golden opportunity to have some, uh, you know, famous co-speaker like Pulitzer Prizer. You know, for me, it's a really honor. I'm sorry about my English. It's my first uh, speech in English. And I'm a little bit scary because I don't have some preparation. I'm sorry. And I want to thank you all for coming. Okay, I have a almost full, uh, you know, full session, full location. And uh, another one, thank you for uh, Jaipur Literature Fest team and uh, Jaipur Literature Fest Festival uh, uh, volunteers who helped me, who uh, create this unbelievable show. Thank you for Mr. Sanjay Roy. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, one big round of applause again for Mark Jan Kamish, Jeffrey Gettleman, and the translator, Sunil Kashi. We don't have copies of Mark Jan's book available here, but please do pick it up. Uh, everybody at the festival wishes him all the best. Jeffrey Gettleman's books are available, and you can get his uh, autographs on your copies. Thank you. Oh, yeah. If, if you want to some ask for me, I will stay to here, and you can come and have some speech with me, you know. We will be back for On Balance Journalism.